Welcome to the CDP weekly press conference. With me, of course, is the General Secretary of our party. He will be making a statement after which he will be taking questions. Jeff? Thank you very much. Um, there are quite a lot of issues um, currently in the media that would require an input from the People's Progressive Party. Um, we have given our positions on these issues several times, but it would do no harm in repeating them. And um, so it's difficult to you know where to start, but maybe I just start from what's in the newspapers today. Um, in today's newspaper, we saw this article in Stab of News, PM says proposed amendment wouldn't weaken integrity law. Now, assume if you read the article, you would see that when I addressed the GMSA dinner on Friday, I spoke about the mixed signals that the government has been given, giving to the public and the international community on the whole question of accountability and transparency. That whilst they are very loud in their condemnation of acts of corruption and they portray themselves as guardians of probity and paradigms of transparency and accountability, that quietly insidiously, secretively, they're in the process of dismantling or influencing or trying to influence the guardians, the institutions that prevent corruption. So we've seen the subversion of the tender board and tender boards across the country, not just the the national one, we have seen attempts to influence the courts and their decisions by the Attorney General bullying judges, um, launching uh, onslaught on them if they were to give decisions that he do not find a favor with him or that are not favorable to him. We have seen um, the, the acts in Parliament, how, they're, how they behave in Parliament. And now the Integrity Commission has been the latest casualty, and I spoke about the Integrity Commission. That this, they voted against making public for the past 10 years submissions to the Integrity Commission whilst claiming that they want decency in public life, but more recently, they have disbanded the Integrity Commission and sent home the staff, and now have all the documents that should really be with the constitutional body. And if that was not enough, just to create this veneer of, of enhancing transparency, this sham, the show of enhancing transparency, the Prime Minister and some of his buddies got together and they're now proposing this, the amendment to the Integrity Commission Act, whilst not complying with it, whilst disbanding the institution, want to amend the act now. And so I spoke of that on last, on last Friday night. So Nagamoto responds today and he says basically that I have it wrong. But I want to, I want to um, show you the letter that he sent to me. And this letter says the attached document title Code of Conduct for Ministers of Government members of the National Assembly and public office holders. Remember, 
that not just ministers, but members of the National Assembly. So the amendment now will put enforcement powers in the hands of the president where ministers and vice presidents are offending or the minister of state, that is Harmon, in the case of other persons in public life. So now, just think about this. The Harmon will now decide the fate of members of parliament because a person in public life may be removed from office when he or she contravenes any of the provisions in this code. So what they are doing now for moving it from an independent body that the executive should have no control over because the members of the executive, including the president, have to submit their statements to this body and be overseen by this body. This body can initiate pros pros prosecutorial action against the president for breach of the Integrity Commission Act. They're seeking now to amend that act and to under this so-called code of conduct which is for not just ministers of the cabinet or the members of the cabinet, but members of parliament and put the enforcement power, the ability to remove people from public life in the hands of the president and the minister of state, Harmon. So it is, not, it is unconstitutional. First of all, Harmon cannot remove a member of parliament who has been elected. So even if there is a breach of this code, Harmon cannot remove a member of parliament. But does this not sound familiar to you? Because it is the same Joseph Harmon who said just last week, or over the weekend, that a presidential immunity could be removed if that person enters active public life. If he is sedate, it's okay. But if that person enters active public life, political life, then his immunities can be removed. There seems to be a pattern here. Um, the Harmon is so wrong on this, and as a lawyer, I'm ashamed for, for him to think that anyone can do this. He or anyone else can remove a constitutional protection. And he said, further to aggravate, aggravate this, this silliness, he said, the police must determine the immunity. Now, policemen can determine immunities of president. That's a constitutional immunity. It, it, it cannot be determined. It's only the courts that ultimately can determine these, these issues. So this is the problem. And, and frankly speaking, so we'll oppose this amendment because this amendment is another tool to seem to seem as though they are doing something about code of conduct for ministers and others, to seem as though they are pursuing transparent, accountable lives. But on the other hand, it's setting the basis for further witch hunt and to come after PPP members by residing what should be independent functions now in the executive, in the arm, arm of the Minister of State. Now, they don't need the integrity. Why does the president need to the integrity commission to report on his ministers if they are breaching the code of conduct? He could set this up himself, and he could then decide to have an independent panel, and that panel can report to him 
about breaches of the code of conduct. And then he could take enforcement action. But it's instructive that they, in all of this, although it relates to members of parliament, the code of conduct, that the PPP was not part of the con committee that they put together to come up with it. And we have 32 members of parliament. They have 33. But, but clearly, it shows a design here. So, so let, me, let me read some of the things that are the code of conduct. For example, you have 10 principles. So you don't need an amendment to the Integrity Commission to, to, um, to enforce this. Integrity. A person in public life and members of his family shall, upon assumption of office, declare their private interests relating to the duties of the public official. They're in breach of that now. They're in breach of that now, most of them by not declaring, making declarations to the Integrity Commission for several years, even whilst they're in opposition. Two, objectivity. A person in public life, in executing public business, shall make decisions based on merit when making public appointments, awarding contracts, or recommending individuals for rewards and benefits. Now, if this is the case, objectivity in public life when awarding contracts or making public appointments, they would have, they breach this every single day. They would all, should all be in jail by now for doing this. We saw the Georgetown Hospital, the breach of the awarding contract, a single sourcing of $605 million worth of drugs. We have seen the bond issue. We have the Durban Park um, fiasco. And not a single person has been even fingered or up for disciplinary action. We have seen Harmon and Basil Williams put um, members from their chambers to be special prosecutors, using up the $100 million that they've set aside. Is that not favoritism? We've seen tons of appointments where cronies are given jobs without any regard for public um, advertisements or qualifications. They're in breach of that now. You don't need an amendment. A per responsibility. A person in public life shall have a basic responsibility to take decisions solely in the national interest without any benefit or personal gain. How come they took the 50% in increase for themselves? They're all in breach of this. They're all in breach of these codes. And Nagamutu, now they're fixing the, his house, the state house. They're um, building a big wall there. All of these things are for themselves. Right then, whilst taxing people. Where is this responsibility that they're talking about? Transparency. A person in public life shall exercise his or her public decision and actions with full and frank disclosure and shall provide, when demanded by the public, an explanation for his or her actions and decisions. Now, let's talk about the 70 persons that they release from from prison, that we have been trying to find out the names of those people. We have gone to the parliament. The president has refused to give the names. We have been find, trying to find out a bit about the parking meter. They're all clamming up. What about Durban Park? We're trying to find out a number of things. We're trying to find out how is it that they managed to get Larry Singh to supply a bond at 14.5 million a month. They refuse to answer all these questions. So this so-called code that they're coming up with is a farce, total farce. They're in breach of this, and they want to, but they're doing it cleverly so that Harmon and the, and the president now will be the enforcers of the code and, and true an amended Integrity Commission Act. They don't need to amend the act. They can have their own code and enforce it. But clearly, they're not, it's not designed for that purpose. So Nagamutu, once again, is the water boy. He's fetching, fetching it. Um, 
And I heard there is a new terminology in the office of the president. When you don't have anything to do, they say, don't nagamutu aram. <laughs> the, um, Phil, the next issue, yeah. the economy. I read the transcript this morning that um, Jordan did an interview, I think, on Gordon Mosley's program. And, and it, to describe, it's pathetic. Pathetic at best. I'm not going to go through the interview, but once again, he repeated oh, a few things. Oh, don't blame us for the decline in the economy. Look around the region. Barbados has problems. Um, a few other countries have problems. There is no foreign currency shortage, and there may be a foreign currency shortage. So he is equivocating on that now. At one time, they were clear about it. And that the economy will do well in the future without clearly stating how. So it's a leap of faith for us to believe in him. If you have a chance to, and I would urge, the, well, maybe the country, to listen to the, the interview. And he spoke for quite a while without saying anything, anything. Well, if there is no foreign currency shortage now, people should be able to go into the bank and buy as much money as they want once it's for legitimate purposes. And that is, that is not happening now. They can't get even small sums of money. They have to join a queue because the markets are not clearing. The markets are not clearing. So whilst there is a posted rate, sometimes 210, 213, 207, 210, that people are selling at because they've limited the spread now, if you, most of the transactions that are taking place, at least the large transactions, are done at the 230 range. So if Jordan was truthful, he would have a weighted, look at all the transactions going through the bank, and do a weighted average, and then that will be the real rate. At which, the weighted average at which the currency is bought and sold. And that is how, so he said that some commercial banks never told the central banks they have a shortage because the central bank has lots of money. And so I would urge today, now, the commercial banks to go over to the central bank based on the minister's interview this morning and present their list of demand. They have a long queue and request from the central bank currency to clear the queue at, at the rate, the posted rate. And I will wager you that there would be, within another week or so, there would be another queue appearing in the banks. Because, so Jordan did not address the fundamentals of which I spoke of at the GMA dinner. And unless he does this in a fashion that is technical, but at the same time offer solutions to the problem, then the rate will keep sliding. And the predictions out there are unbelievable. Because most people I talk to who are in the know, they believe the rate will skyrocket to 250, 300. Because, and here are a few things that I spoke of 
that he's yet to respond. Now, in the balance of payment, we have five elements uh, that are major exports on the export side. Gold, rice, sugar, bauxite, and timber. And as I pointed out, uh, rice in 2014 brought in 249 million. In 2016, it fell to 182. Sugar, 88 um, in 2014, 67 in 2016. Bauxite, 124 million in, in 2014, 100 million in 2016. Timber, 53 million, declined to 40 million in that period. Foreign direct investment declined from 205 million to 103 million. Net private transfers, that's remittances, from 457 million to 274 million. So you will see on, on the, the current account as well as the capital account of our balance of payment, the supply of foreign currency to our market has dropped significantly, almost in every category that I've mentioned. Where we have had a difference on the saving side, the positive side now, it's gold. Gold moved from 469 million in 2014 to 778 million in 2016. But you would recall, you would recall that a lot of the gold production is from two large new gold mines. And so, whilst the it were, the, the export figure is high. Not all of the foreign currency will come back because a lot of that is kept abroad for other purposes, for transactional purposes. Only money for, to pay wages and salaries, local procurement, the taxes, etc., come back. So the foreign currency flow back is not necessarily the same among from foreign companies, the local companies make a difference. And then fuel and lubricants also fell from 573 million US import in 2014 to 337 in, in 2016. So those were the two positive things. But look what ha has happened now. In 2017, it's estimated that the price for fuel imports will move up back from 337 to 433. So, again, more pressure. So those are the things that tend to determine the supply of currency and the demand for, for, for currency. Import demand has remained pra practically around the same. So when you, these, this is the problem. And then added to this is the state borrowing large sums of money that Jordan himself said from the local market. When you borrow in G dollars, there is a, you have to find foreign currency because we have a high level of, of import. For every dollar spent locally, there's a significant part of foreign currency component to that. So it increases demand there. And I had already pointed out when I, in my budget speech about 90 something percent now, 92 percent. In 2014, it was about 50%. Now, 92% this year of our national investment, private and public, will come from domestic saving, savings and not foreign sources. When you put all of these together, what, do they, what picture do they tell? What, what do they mean to our balance of payment on our currency and our interest rates? That is what he needs to deal with. Not the platitudes of Barbados um, had issues and Trinidad got issues and stuff. I already pointed out a lot of those economies are oil based economies. Barbados for very, has a fixed exchange rate. Barbados has had, not had economic growth for a long time of any major note. Ghana has been growing continuously for the past nearly 10 years. Different sorts of issues. 
And so he's not addressing that, nor is he addressing. So he tells the manufacturers, you've got to produce more. But I've also focused on the things that he has done to the productive sector. So he, apart from, apart from what's happening on the balance of payment, you, you've seen the, um, on, on, in forestry, I have a list of the things. I, it's unbelievable. Even when we are debating the budget, you don't really disaggregate. So you don't have a full picture of what the VAT will go on now. But, but for example, VAT will be on manicoal palms, on logs, on staves, on shingles, on lumber, on piles, on ply, on almost all forest products. So just imagine you were in the forestry sector suddenly and you're selling in the local market the cost of your product goes up when the cost goes up demand for that product reduces so it is not going to help with growth in the sector added to that because people use those things for construction there is now vat on stone sand um, concrete blocks, a whole range of stuff. So that will kill construction. And we know of that on the many other things that they already have. So which, and the gold mining sector, the miners have already made it clear because that seems to be the on, only bright spot in the economy so far. So what, what the miners are saying, if they persist with these three tax measures that were introduced, that sector will practically, at least the local ones, the local miners, will may, may collapse. It would lead to a significant shrinkage of production. Where are we going? Where is the minister's plan to stimulate all of these sectors? Shipping is down, construction is down, Retail trade is down, forestry is down, manufacturing is down, rice down, sugar down, everything is down. And even gold now with the, what they've just passed. What are his plans? What's the government's plans? So all of this talk about blaming someone else, etc. It's just, it, it does not cut ice with, with us. He needs to be clear about their way forward. And uh, and then the concerns about the exchange rate, and then these mixed signals that they keep sending. So maybe I, I, I've spoken long enough about that, but clearly this government has no economic, economic plan. Has no economic plan. They, it may be useful now that I heard the IMF is here um, to, to talk a bit about the exchange rate and stuff like that. On um, the next thing I want to deal with is these excuses that are being made. And, and we, ha we see creative use. So, so I'm going to come to that in a moment, but let me talk about Pradoville. Um, so far, a lot has been written about this. Um, you have heard our positions, and that it's a witch hunt. I've made it clear that this government's entire attention seemed to, seem to be focused in this regard. And uh, there seems to be much more than this. There, there seems to be a conspiracy to. And uh, hopefully, at some point in time, we will and, and maybe I can get your help in trying to, to determine where, whether there is this conspiracy. I've seen, um, you, you've heard about Mr. Nandalal issued a statement. And in fact, he mentioned something and the British High Commissioner issued a statement saying that 
there was no member of staff of the High Commission celebrating the arrest of nationals of Guyana, people in constitutional posts, along with ministers of the government and members of the SOKU. So we have a totally different view of what took place. And it would be good if the media, which prides itself on digging up a lot of um, playing the truth, could investigate this matter further. So, Mr. Nandalal wrote, I thank the British, this is after he issued the statement that neither he nor, nor members of the High Commission nor Mr. Sitlington, Ton, Sit, Sitlington is, is, uh, was at the Oasis ca Cafe celebrating the arrest. So, I thank the British High Commission, Mr. His Excellency Greg Quinn, for a statement issue which purports to clarify the role of Dr. Sam Sitlington at the Special Organized Crime Unit. It confirms that Dr. Sitlington functions at SOKU in an advisory and training capacity and not in an operational role. However, based upon information I've received from clients who have been the subject of SOKU's investigations and from what I personally observed on Tuesday 9th of March 2017, it is difficult not to conclude that Dr. Sittlington may have exceeded his official remit and trespassed into operational matters at SOKU. Moreover, it is awfully difficult to reconcile the admitted remit of Dr. Sittlington at SOKU, that is, as an advisor and a trainer, with him explaining to the press the legal basis and rights on which SOKU took the actions they did. In my humble view, this latter function seems better suited for the Public Relations Department of the Guyana Police Force, of which SOKU is a part. The content of what he disclosed to the press swayed him in yet another direction, the political rim. You'd remember he mentioned the PPP in that, in his statement. These unfortunate utterances only exacerbated an already ignoble situation. Further, I have consulted with my source who was, at, who was present at Oasis Cafe on Wednesday 10th of March 2017 and who reiterates that His Excellency Mr. Quinn himself and two other staff members of the British High Commission were present at the establishment. It is highly regrettable that there should be a conflict on such a simple matter. Perhaps a deeper probe by the media may result in greater clarity. Now, there are a few things here that we need to, to know. I have information that Mr. Sittleton has been on raids with Soku. He's gone into the premises of nationals of Guyana in as part of these raids, being part of the operations itself. So that's one. That's the first thing. So if the British High Commissioner is saying he has no operational mandate as part of his job, then he will be open. This, we have a foreigner here who is trespassing on the rights of Guyanese citizens, tolerated by our government. Tolerated by our government. Secondly, I gather that he was the one who drove the police over to my office when they came there. Because I did not see him in the compound, but I was told he was the driver of the vehicle to effect the arrest. Thirdly, I gather 
he came here when, we, when the PPP was in office to look for work. And he, at that time, with the money laundering bill, he did not succeed. He did not succeed. He did not get, get any work at that time. They, fourth, fourthly, there, it's easy to find out um, if the president wants to do this. And from what we talked about at State House, it seems as though he's inclined to go this route. It's easy to find out where the political instructions, the effect the arrest came from. It was a meeting with some ministers and the leadership, some individuals in the police force. And then five. The first thing is for the minister to admit, he, was, he admitted that he was drinking with some members of SOKU. Can you imagine a minister? Just look at what's happening now in the US. President Trump calls the special prosecutor in New York and the special prosecutor, the, the prosecutor there, the district attorney, or I think he is, he says, he seeks legal advice and says, I can't take his call because there's a protocol, separation. In this case, a man who the week before had said, next week um, you're going to have some arrests and people will be charged, will be, be charged next week, who been Loose, loosely um, saying, I was going to say something else about him, but not now. That was said in Parliament already. We've been talking about locking up people for ages. Um, he then, he sits with the people from this unit. And what's even worse now, that we are hearing that Sittleton was there as well as members of the High Commission. The High Commissioner said, that's not so. So it would be simple to find out. I, I trust Anil Nandilal. I trust Nandilal, and I trust what he has said here. So by converse, you understand what I mean. And so the, 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 the it means that we have to investigate this because this is serious. If a foreign rep sits with an, a so-called advisor who has now taken in, been involved in an operational role to go into people's homes in Guyana, etc., and a minister, a politician, and members of a special or organized crime unit to drink wine immediately after some arrests were made, it warrants a full-fledged investigation. And the president who likes commission of, commissions of inquiry should set up one to do this because it means a lot for independence and our dignity and who we are as a people. Because if we start allowing this to happen, it's like a going back to colonial days. And this is the president who came to our parliament and spoke at least 50th, the 50th anniversary of our independence. Um, spoke about the ills of colonialism and the need for us to determine our future together. So, coming back to the key point, I would like to urge what Anil Nandilal has urged, that an, an investigation takes place the highest level, if we had it, an office, independent office that deals with integrity of ministers, then that would have been investigated already. And secondly, it's easy, easier for the media to do some investigative work. 
not to put out fake news on this one, but to do some serious investigative work that could be redeeming. This is, this is very, very important, important to, to us. But this government has a, a way, I, on Prado Bill Forda, someone, um, because they've been, this whole issue about, um, about this tower, you know, a significant part of the audit dealt with the tower, uh, the, that is the NCN mass at the, at the site and whether that was moved to facilitate the construction of Pradoville. And so what they did was to add the cost of moving the tower, etc., to the cost of the development of the project. So it's over a hundred odd million dollars more to say this is how much Pradoville cost the state. Now there have been several reports um, pointing out that there are two separate issues. I received anonymously um, a package. And I'm gonna share with you a few of these um, because I've asked something them to share. But here, the first one I have is a letter from Mr. McDesey dated April 19, 2004 to Mr. Rawl Edinburgh, who is the tongue and country planning officer. And it says, Ogle Airport Zoning Regulations 2004. Please find attached final amendments to the above mentioned documentation indicated in red. We are not aware of any further changes. With respect to the progress on the movement on the mass at Sparendam, it is in the interest of the airport that plans commence to have this mass removed or reduced in height since in its present location, it penetrates the obstacle clearance limits of the new runway development, and it is a hazard to aviation. This is in 2004, a letter from Mr. McDesey to Royal Edinburgh, and, and it gives all the, the specs, etc. here. Another letter from Mr. McDesey to Mr. Rumford, who is the Director General, Civil Aviation Authority. This dated June 20, 2005. Sparring them, radio mass penetrating obstacle clearance surface, Ogle Airport. That's the title. Um, I'm not going to read the, everything else. Um, please see attach a plan showing the obstacle in the after takeoff flight path, RW06 Airport, Ogle Airport. You will notice that the mass penetrates the surface for precision approach and overshoot by 164 feet. It is therefore a safety hazard to air navigation for aircraft operating out of the Ogle Airport. In our discussions with the Minister of Public Works and Communications during the introduction of the zoning regulations, he undertook to examine the feasibility of removing the mass or reducing the height of the mass. Since the mass has been there for over 40 years, etc., it goes on. This is submitted to you for your information and also to seek your assistance to intervene with the minister to have the mass owner operator arrange to have the mass removed or reduced in height. This was 2005. And all several years before Bradoville was developed. We then have a letter from McDesey to Mohamed Sattar. The, the chief executive officer of NCN, and he speaks here about the limitations about on the mass. He says, there are two limitations of which the lower two will apply. The bulk landing surface limit is 200 feet. The inner horizontal surface limit is 147 feet, seven inches. Therefore, the mass needs to be at or below 147 feet, seven inches. And then we have the ITEC consultant, a Mr. Jen, writing, doing a technical work and saying, um, the highly permissible at the Sparanda mass is 147.7 inches, that's what is requested, whereas the actual height of the tower is shown at 350 feet. 
This was now a, a year later. As for technical requirements for medium to wave transmission to achieve maximum radiation efficiency and desired polar pattern, the height of self-radiating mass should be a wavelength of operating frequency 4, which for the 560 kilohertz works out to be 440 feet. Under these operating parameters, it's not feasible to reduce the mass, the height of the mass to 148 feet. The only option available is to shift to a new suitable site where a tower height of 440 feet is permissible under ICAO regulations. This is from the technical person who was under the Indian, Indian um, advisory program. These, all of these correspondences long predated, long predated the the development of Pradoville. Yet every time, including from the audit, every time the government speaks, they convey the impression that the sole purpose of removing this mass was for the establishment of the housing scheme and, and put the expenditure on removing the mass and shifting it elsewhere to the development cost of the housing scheme. So this is how it's spun, spun all the time. Because if people see the development costs are huge, then they would say, hold on a minute, when this, they, they splurge on this area. So let me, let me give you an example of, of how the government does this all the time, even in the face of knowledge to the contrary. Because they, have, they must have all of this information. So cool. it's public record. This is public record. They would have this. They would know it's not so. But why do they persist? It's like in Parliament last Thursday, we had this issue of Hamilton Green. The government seeking to give him a special pension plus a pension index to the salary of the current prime minister plus the other benefits of former presidents. One, Mr. Green has never been president, so never head of state nor head of government. So all the examples they give about benefits to people, prime ministers, former prime ministers, in every single one of those cases, those were heads of government. In Guyana's case, our prime minister is not head of government, nor is he head of state. Both uh, reside with the pr in the presidency, executive president we have. So that's the first point. Then they tried to say, we, we treated Samuel Hines badly. We did not make allowances for Samuel Hines as a former prime minister. And of course, oh, Samuel Hines was treated badly because we didn't do that. But we treated him too go good or too well by making him, to giving him the benefits of a former president to which he is not uh, uh, entitled because he served for too short a time. So on one hand, you treated him badly as prime minister. We didn't make all these allowances for him. But then we treated him, you know, preferentially by giving him the former president's benefit. Conflicting. Then they spoke about a 2004, the 2004 amendment to, for pre presidential pensions. And they said, Jack Dale did this. There was only one man who will benefit from this, Jack Dale. But in 2004, when we index the salary, the pension of former presidents to the current president in office, I was the president in office at that time. I wasn't getting a penny pension. I wasn't getting a pension. So who did the indexation help? It helped two persons, Alter Chung, because he had retired since 1980, 
And so his pension had, because it's calculated on his last salary, was very low. So by indexing it to my salary, his pension got up and Jana Jagan. Those were the only two persons who were the beneficiary on the, the indexation. Yet they made it look like it was Jagdeo. The indexation was done for Jagdeo. I was getting a salary at that time. And they said, they passed this now. Can you imagine the, this dishonesty? They're saying about we had to do this to ensure that Hamilton Green lived the honorable life to which he was accustomed to as in his high office as, as prime minister. But Arthur Chung was not entitled to it because Arthur Chung was getting a pension based on his 1980 salary, which we sought to fix by indexing it, his pension to the salary of the person in office. So that was one. And then we inserted a clause to say, widows of those um, persons will get a pension that is 50%. 50% of a former president's um, benefits when he dies or when she, when she dies. So that was it. So I, I wasn't dead, so I couldn't be benefiting from it too. It was designed to help the widows of people, former presidents. Yet they made that whole 2004 amendment it was about Jack Deal. And then they didn't say, if you look at the, the bill, we introduced a President Hoyt Pensions Act. And so although President Hoyt had died already, had died, we passed in 2009 an act, it called President Hoyt Pensions Act 2009. And here are the provisions. This act may be cited as President Hoyt Pensions Act 2009, and it shall be deemed to have come into operation on the 22nd day of December 2002. We made it retroactive to 2002, so that two, notwithstanding anything in Section 5 of the President's uh, the Pensions Act, the widow of the late President Hoyt shall be entitled to receive an enhanced pension calculated in accordance with Section 3 of the Pensions Act 2004 from the date when the widow's pension first became payable. So we, we then made this President Hoyt benefits retroactive to that period and then gave her 50% of it. So she ended up getting over $500,000 a month, Mrs. Hoyt, because at that time the president's salary was about uh, just about a million. So that Mr. Hoyt's pension would have been close to a million, and then she got 50% of it. All that was done to, to help people, to help. So, but this all became about me. So next thing is they said that Jack Dale's salary jumped 300% because it was indexed to the Attorney General and the Chancellor. And it's true that the salary was then equated, not indexed, equated to the three. So the three persons started getting the same salary. The Attorney General was getting almost three times more than the President. But listen to Nagamutu's justification when he was in office. I have to get a dollar more than the Attorney General to show seniority. That was his justification for, for the wages increase. But in that case, he didn't have a problem with the President earning three times less than the Attorney General, in my case. So assuming all of that is accurate, Jagdio got this big increase. So by the time he left office, his salary was 1.5 million. The minister's starting salary after the 50% now and with, with the salary alone is over 900,000 now. The prime minister's starting salary in this government was $1.7 million. 
So after 12 years, I ended my tenure with a salary of 1.5 million. But his after two weeks in office, Nagamutu comes into office and starts off at 1.7 million. And they're still complaining about my, the 1.5 I get. If they feel it was so wrong, they should really go back to the 2006, 2007 level. They should have cut their salaries, not increase it, but the fallacy of it. And then Felix lists all of the things in the, the former president's bill that we passed. And he did not say that former presidents used to get this. So he said the bill has security, it has vehicles, drivers, uh, maids, electricity payment, water payment, etc. What he did not say that Arthur Chung, Janet Jagan, Desmond Hoyt, when they retired, they all had all of those things, the two tickets, etc. So it's not anything new that we took. We just codified it, put it in the law. So it is just, they're still so obsessed, obsessed with that. That's the only fig leaf they have and it's getting smaller it's it's drying up the fig leaf is drying up because it can't cover their nakedness and greed and so misrepresentation now so they come now to do the they can't afford the three former presidents but they could afford these 27 ministers with the youth spending on them they can't afford to the vat but they can, they can build all these fancy buildings they're putting up and buy new vehicles, etc. They, they, they can't afford these things. And they couldn't afford our benefits, so they had to cut them. But now they're giving Hami a benefit that will work out to maybe $1.5 million a month. We said give him an ex-gratia payment. Give him a 15, 20 million dollars whatever, but you can't make him eligible for things where he never served. He never served as a former president, but he's now, by law, going to get that. We don't have a problem with him giving Hamilton Green an ex gratia payment, but they sought to do it by making spurious arguments, and so it comes back to the tower. They have all of this information, but they keep, every time they talk about it, they, put, they add that into it. It come, becomes an issue because it makes the capital expenditure look great. And so I'll probably share out some of these. I'll, I'll give you the details of that a, a little bit um, later. And the last thing is the, the drug issue. Now they keep saying every time single source. And until now, every day I look at the, the newspapers and they say PPP sing, single source from new GPC. And I have to point out uh, once again that there were public tenders. If you look at the audit report, you'd see there are public tenders for pre-qualification. So public tender open to everyone. People were pre-qualified. They then went through an assessment. In fact, there was a constitutional case filed. And you should look for the, by one of the purchasers of drugs who were importing drugs, constitutional motion. And you should look at the decision of the court when he challenged this. And so, and the, after the pre-qualification, <coughs> it's only the pre-qualified suppliers that you go to because they would have had to go, on, go through some rigorous testing, the facilities and the, whether the drugs are registered and a whole range of stuff. In this case, we see several violations, several violations, and it's a pattern of behavior. We have seen it in, in the contract for the Sheriff Street. We have seen it for the water treatment plants. We have seen it for GPL meter, that the government goes out to tender several times. And if the tenders don't yield the results they want, they annul the tender. They keep annulling the tender. We're not proceeding anymore. In fact, I've seen GWI now award some contracts to so some foreigners to do wells. 
And I've not seen that gone through any procurement process. It's directly, direct contracting under the promise that they can do it twice as much cheaper. Just promise. If that's the case, we should disband our tender board, go to ministers and say, or, or head of the agencies, you know, I can do this cheaper. Like, that's how they decided on the $426 million fertilizer contract. The explanation they gave, one guy walked into the PS at Agriculture and said, I, I can supply this fertilizer cheaper. He sent, they sent him over to um, the minister who sent him over to, to GRDB, and he walked out with a $420-something million contract. That is how you operate. And in this case, so let me give you on pro the procurement, GPAC procurement of medical supplies, advertised on October 2nd, 2016, they canceled that. The Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation procurement of pharmaceuticals, advertised on November 6th, 2016, canceled. GPHC procurement of emergency medical supplies number two advertised 2nd of February 2017, selective tendering, um, canceled. Four, GPHC procurement of emergency medical supply number two advertised on 2nd of February, selective tender, that, that canceled too. So four times they canceled. The, the attempt to publicly procure drugs. So you deliberately, this was since October last year, so you deliberately create the shortage. Now the minister can say, we, we, uh, there are several questions the minister raised in her statement. She said people have been delinquent, some of the suppliers, so Tell the country who is delinquent. What are, the, what are the names? If you found people to be delinquent, you tell us who the, del the, people, the, the delinquents are. And how, in the first case, they got the contracts because they didn't go through tender. Many of them got the contracts directly. So tell the country who the delinquents are. Secondly, what are they delinquent for? She then said that we, um, many of them supplied substandard drugs. So who supplied substandard drugs and what drugs were substandard? These are vital questions to, that the country must know who the people are because obviously there is a whole layer going on behind the scenes that we don't know of. And so when the minister discovered this, this shortage, she should have said, all right, we will, um, why did they cancel the, the tender from the February 2nd? I got a, Valda Lawrence was already there by February 2nd. She was there, why did they cancel the tender? And why did they get a direction? Now, the Georgetown Public Corporation is an independent agency incorporated by law. The minister can't tell them who to buy from and, and what procurement process they should follow. That's a function of the board. So did the board, did the board decide that they are going to and they, as usual, they just, it never made the newspaper in a prominent way. I see it did the other papers. But just observe the standards here. Observe the standards here. And you will conclude for yourself what's happening. Massive, massive um, cover up on these matters. And, and, Anyhow, let me end there. Thank you. All right. <laughs>